In this video, I want to talk about how we can view selection bias as an issue with samples. And that's going to lead us on to, in future videos, as to a discussion of matching and propensity scores. So the idea is that, in general, what we're interested in estimating is the average causal effect. So that's the expectation of this term, delta i, which might, let's say, represent the difference in potential level of some outcome variable, so the expectation of y, let's say, if an individual chooses a treatment w plus 1, and we are interested in how that differs from an individual who only chose, or if that individual rather chose w. So what we're interested in is the difference between these two potential levels of outcome. And the problem is, is that in general what we have is we don't actually get to view this potential level of outcome. What we actually have is we have those individuals who chose, let's say, a treatment of W plus 1, and we have those individuals who chose W. And if we just look at the difference in mean of the outcome variable Y between these two groups, we know that this is not necessarily going to represent the average causal effect. So the difference in means doesn't represent the average causal effect. And the reason behind that is because essentially what we're doing is we are comparing apples with oranges. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that there is going to be some sort of selection bias, whereby an individual chooses in which group they actually end up in, and that choice actually has influence over this difference in means, and it doesn't necessarily just represent the causal effect. To make that concrete, essentially what we're saying is that there are some underlying factors, which I'm going to call here as our sort of vector xi, which determine which of these groups an individual goes for, and the differences between these two groups reflect differences in xi, these other covariates which are important in determining yi, uh, or the potential level of yi, and hence the difference in the means between these two groups doesn't represent the average causal effect. And we've seen in the last video how we can actually use linear regression as a means to actually allow us, at least conditionally, to evaluate the average causal effect. So conditional on xi, we've seen that in certain circumstances, linear regression allows us to evaluate the average causal effect. So that's one solution to the selection bias problem, is just to include this list of covariates in your regression and sort of hope for the best. But there are other ways and perhaps slightly better ways and slightly newer ways of actually controlling for the selection bias problem. And essentially, all of these methods hinge on the fact that selection bias is essentially a problem with samples. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the fact that we're comparing this group in W plus 1 with those with W, and we're comparing apples with oranges because there are different levels of covariates which are also important in determining the output variable. And these problems with a sample, as I said, reflect differences in these covariates xi. So what we could think to do is if we were to make the samples very similar in terms of xi, then in those circumstances, the selection bias might actually go. And the reason it will go is because of the fact that if we actually make these samples the same in terms of these other covariates, then we will be comparing apples with apples in that circumstance. Because all the other covariates which are important in determining the output variable will also be controlled for. And once we are comparing apples with apples, we'll be able to unpick then the average causal effect just by comparing the average between these two groups. In order to highlight how this might work, I want to talk through an example. And the example is one which I've given in previous videos. It's essentially the circumstance where a manager is interested in the effect of on-the-job training. So the situation here is that an individual I chooses whether or not to undertake on-the-job training. So in other words, JI is either equal to 1 if they do and 0 if they don't. And what the manager is actually interested in evaluating is the expectation of delta i. In other words, the expectation of the individual causal effect, which we know is the average causal effect. And what he's interested in is the difference in expectation between the level of sales an individual I would obtain if they did undertake the on-the-job training compared with the level of sales which they would have obtained if they hadn't undertaken the on-the-job training. 
And we know that importantly, this in general does not equal the expectation of those individuals who, or the actual average level of sales for those individuals who did undertake on the job training minus the expected level or the average level of sales for those individuals who didn't take on the job training. So importantly, it doesn't reflect this simple difference of means because of the issues here, because what we can actually assume here is that those individuals who perhaps did take on the job training are perhaps more motivated than those who didn't undertake on the job training. So essentially, we'll be running into the same issue of comparing apples with oranges, whereby comparing the mean level of sales between these two groups reflects the fact that there is also some difference in motivation and hence the difference between these two groups averages doesn't represent the average causal effect. So what we might think here is that perhaps XI, an important covariate, might be an indicator of a past level of sales for that particular individual. So it might represent the past year's level of sales or perhaps the past few months level of sales, for example. And we might think that XI here is a relatively good indicator of the sort of innate motivation and innate sort of goodness, if you like, of how good a salesman is. So what we might like to think here is that if we were able to make the two groups, those that did undertake on the job training and those that didn't, similar in term, or comparable at least in terms of the past year's level of sales, then we might be able to understand the difference in mean between these two groups as representing some sort of causal effect. But until, until we do that, we certainly can't represent this average causal effect by the difference between the two groups. So the idea here is that what we might do is we might think about those group who, or that group rather, that did undertake on the job training. And so that's that group for which JI is equal to one. And what we might do with that group is we might split this up into four different subgroups. And the idea is that each of these different subgroups has a different level on average of the past year's level of sales. So this first year group, or this first group rather, might have a past year's level of sales of let's say 10, I'm not specifying units here, the second group of 15, the third group of 20, and the last group and the best performing group of 25. And the idea is that if we could essentially come up with a group who were not treated, in other words, that, that group which didn't choose on the job training, so that's the group for which JI is equal to zero, and if we could come up with subgroups within that group which reflected each of these or actually reflected exactly which was that in the treated group, then we might then be able to unpick some sort of average causal effect. So the idea is that if we could come up with a subsample of those individuals who weren't treated, who had, let's say, a past year's level of sales of 10, and another group which had a past year's level of sales of 15, 20, and 25, then what we might then be able to do is we might be able to then compare these means of each of these subgroups. Because then what we might be thinking we're doing is we're actually controlling for how innately good a particular salesman is. And hence the difference in mean between, let's say, the 10 group and the treated and those that weren't treated might then represent the causal effect of the on-the-job training on that particular group, that is. And then we'd get a different value for the 15 group, 20 and 25. So then what we might do is we might take a sort of weighted average over each of these four groups. And then what we might hope is that that would then give us an average causal effect. And an important thing to note is that essentially what I'm saying is that we don't necessarily need the entire sample of individuals who weren't treated. In other words, what we're actually going to do is we're going to do away with some of those individuals who are untreated. And we're just going to leave those individuals who are directly comparable with those that are treated. And then because they're directly comparable in terms of their indicator of how good they are as a salesman, Comparisons between these two groups might be then seen to have a causal effect. And note, there's nothing special about the fact that I've split this, these two groups up into four subgroups. I could sort of do this at the individual level, or I could do it with sort of larger groups. The idea is that is the same in each of these cases. Essentially, what we're doing is we're trying to make the two samples comparable in terms of important covariates. And then, and only then, can the difference in simple means be seen to have a causal representation. So the idea is that we can remove selection bias by modifying our samples. And that's going to lead us on to the discussion of matching 
because essentially that's what we're doing. We're matching different samples um, between the treated and untreated. And it's also going to lead us to talk about propensity scores in the next few videos.